Hello, this is Daryl from House for All Nations International Campus. Thank you so much for being here and, and watching this sermon. Uh, it is laid upon our hearts that this sermon would be used um, so that your love and affection for Jesus and the church would grow. In no way um, does this replace the church that God's placed you and the shepherd, uh, the pastor that God has placed in your life to shepherd and take care of your soul. Um, but I, I pray that you would continue to join your church um, uh, where, where God is preached and proclaimed there. And so God bless you as you watch this. I pray that you enjoy this. God bless. Um, they will have some priority, but then um, just, just sign up and then uh, we just pray that you will be able to join us here. Okay? So open up Colossians, whoopsies, open up Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. I want to say this. Um, as we read this, as we're going through Colossians, um, I'm taking a little bit of a different approach. And as we have different later on guest speakers, Ochi is going to be speaking in November 22nd, on November 22nd. Um, I'm excited for that. So we've been going through the sermon series and just looking through different things. Um, uh, and then we'll have other guest speakers as well. Um, but I'm taking a little bit of a different approach. You and I have grown up in such a church that, uh, in churches where many times we receive, we receive, we receive. Everybody say receive. Everybody say receive. Good, all right. Yeah, and so we grow up in a church that we come and we receive a lot of good stuff, you know? We come here and the, um, the, the multimedia, the logistics team, they've set up all this stuff. The music team, they set up all this stuff. And then we get to sit down and join in to worship. That's so good and so beautiful. But I want to begin to change our mindset. And as we continue to move forward, I want us to begin to be a little bit more intentional in being the church, being here with, with one another, being here for one another. And so it might be a little bit uncomfortable, but I think it's going to be beautiful. Everybody say beautiful. Yeah, I know. I, I love this, you know, because uh, whenever I say, say this, I don't hear like the response back on Zoom, but now I can get some response. So everybody say beautiful. Okay, all right, that's all right. All right, yeah, and so, and so my approach as I um, meet with you and as I teach, yes, I pray that I will be faithful to the word, especially as Colossians talks about uh, false teaching, talks about heresy. I do not want to be teaching you false teachings, but I also want you to engage in responding. So it's not just, oh, that's great, that's, that's, that's a lot of good information because there is a lot of information. But I, my goal is not to give you more and more information, but my goal is so that you would take another baby step in following Jesus. Amen? Let's try it again. Another baby step for you in following Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so that is us journeying together as a church. Now, we are a small enough church so that I can actually see you and know you personally. Now, I pray that there will be a day that I do not know each and every person personally. And, and maybe your idea is, okay, as the pastor, you should. No, no, no. I, I, let, 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 me, let me pull aside from that. As the pastor, I don't need to know everybody. But everybody needs to be known by somebody. Let me say it again. As a pastor, I don't need to know everybody. But everybody needs to be known by somebody. And to be loved by somebody. If you're in my vicinity, and if you're in my, uh, if, if, if in that moment, I'm sensing like, okay, God is calling me to connect with you. Sure, I'd love to. But just, we can't expect uh, uh, just the pastor. We can't expect just the care group leaders. We can't expect, so one another, we are to be the church. Everybody say, be the church. And so, Akel, I don't know what your gifts are, your spiritual gifts are, but God's given you a spiritual gift to be used for the church. As Brian, God's given you a spiritual gift. As Nick, God's given you a spiritual gift. As Will, as Martin, as Livia, God's given you, each one of you, a spiritual gift that you can join in the service, join in, not just in the service, but join in in this family and do life because we need you. Tell the person next to you, we need you. Tell the person next to you in the Zoom, we need you, even though they can't hear you. We need you. We need you. And so I want to start off this sermon saying this. To the saints of House for All Nations International Campus. To the saints of House for All Nations International Campus. Welcome. Welcome in being here and joining together. Welcome for those of you who are online 
and joining us here to proclaim what we believe. Welcome, saints. Now, I know some of you here, you're not saints. And what I mean by saints, as I explained last week, is a saint is someone who is set apart. Now, I'm not saying a saint is someone who's holy and you have a halo. Uh, um, last, uh, we had Sunday school a couple days ago or yesterday, and they made little angels and like, oh, can we put a halo on it? Now, a saint is not someone who has a halo and well, it just walks perfectly. In fact, saints, yeah, they look pretty awful many times. The people that you get disappointed, yeah, they can be saints. Now, it's a different definition of how maybe you've grown up or, or, or the, the, the world uh, defines saints. But you are saints. But also, I know some of you here are not saints because why? What differentiates you of being a saint and not a saint is that God has set you apart because you've made that decision and say, I believe in Jesus. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the gospel truth. That what, that's what sets us apart now, you can be a saint, and the goal is not like, oh, I want to be a saint, so, so I can be like Saint Daryl, right? Saint Jessalyn, or Saint whoever. Like, no, that's not the goal. But the goal is for us to be, to be together, united, for the sake of the gospel and the spreading of the gospel. Now, I know um, the gospel, we've used that word pretty often uh, in church. But today, beautifully, Paul um, lays it out to the, uh, the Colossians. The, to the church in Colossae, he lays it out beautifully in a prayer. So I want to ask this question, and I want you to be quick to this, okay? I want to ask you this question uh, to raise your hand. Followers of Jesus Christ, raise your hand. Followers of Jesus Christ, raise your hand. Yeah, followers of Jesus Christ, raise your hand. So uh, in verse 3 to 8 is actually one long sentence. In your Bibles, it might not be a long sentence, but in the original, it's a long sentence. And right here, Paul establishes um, to the Colossian church, because remember, this is a letter that he's writing to the Colossian church, and he establishes um, this, this prayer, and he's saying, hey, this is a prayer of thanksgiving to God for you for what he's already done. So this is talking about the past. Later on next week, it's going to be talking more about the future and the prayer that he has for the people but this right here is talking about this is what i thank god for what he has done in you and through you okay so this is what's happening in verse three to eight and so paul establishes the fact that he and his associates are constantly praying and so before we continue on would you stand up with me we're going to read the word together but we're going to pray first so stand with me wherever you are once again we're going to pray together and we're standing in honor of the word of god um, but let's pray together before we uh read let's let's pray oh god creator of the universe Thank you that we can come here. Thank you that we can come here. And once again, I want to say thank you that we can come here to worship together. Yes, I absolutely thank you that we can come here to worship together in person. It's been seven months, oh God. And I thank you also that others can join on Zoom. We thank you for technology that we can do this. Teach us to do this well. Teach us, Lord, to engage with you as you have, uh, you have come to earth to engage with us, O oh Jesus. And as we read your word, I pray for clarity. I pray for clarity. Would you use my words and, and would you use the thoughts of my mind and my heart? Forgive me, Lord, of, uh, of things, Lord, um, that I've done knowingly or unknowingly. I pray that that doesn't get in the way of what you are doing and what you will do. So speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right, remain seated, uh, remain seated, remain standing, and we're going to read Colossians um, 1, starting verse 3 to 8. Let's read this together. 1, 2, and by the way, um, I do not have slides, and so, um, yeah, if you're at home, grab your Bibles and just engage uh, in this, and just, just continue to open up your Bibles as we engage in the Word today. Okay, Colossians 1, starting verse 3. 1, 2, 3. We are... Always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Out loud, verse 4, 1, 2, 3. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel. Verse 6, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world is bearing fruit and growing. 
as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Oh God, we thank you that we can read this out loud. I pray, O oh Lord, would you speak to us in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Please be seated. Is there no water in here now to have water? Exception for the pastor, right? Okay. All right. Um, bird's eye view. Everybody say bird's eye view. I wish we had a bird's eye view of this place so you can see that we are maintaining social distancing. Um, that said, I want to take you in a bird's eye view for like just five minutes or so in this passage right here. Because I, um, as much as I want to teach and dive into what this is, um, what he's talking about, I, I want to I lean into something else, but I want to give you a bird's eye view of verse 3 to verse 8 and what this is all about. So what Paul is doing here is he's giving to us, he's, he's, he's telling the Colossian church, hey, I thank God, and this is so beautiful. I did not know when I actually did the introduction for two weeks, I thought like, why am I spending two weeks in, in verse 1 and 2, uh, and why am I spending that much time? And then as I was preparing this week, and I, I read this, we always thank God. Woo! What's so, well, aha, about that? It's Thanksgiving! Yeah, yeah. Only, um, I did not plan that out. But right here it says, we always thank God. How's your Thanksgiving, church? How's your Thanksgiving? I'm not talking about Thanksgiving Day, you know. Oh, I didn't have a turkey yet. I'm not going to get a turkey yet. Like, that's not what I'm talking about. But how's your Thanksgiving before God, to God? This is so amazing that Paul says, we always thank God. Like, is he, is he being... Sar not sarcastic. Is he being, um, what's the word? Uh, is, is he exaggerating? He always thanks God? But continue to look at this. He says, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since you heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. Now, bird's eye view. Okay, bird's eye view. So follow along best you can right now. What we're talking about here in, in this 3 to 8, the main point is verse 5. In verse 5, it says this, Of this you have heard before the word of the truth, the gospel. He's talking about the gospel. In verse, verse uh, 3 to 8, or 3 to 7, he's talking about the gospel, the importance of the gospel, how the gospel has transformed, the gospel has changed. What is the gospel? comes from the Greek word evangelion, which you guys don't care, but that's okay. It makes me sound more fancy. But evangelion, which we get the word evangelize. And this is actually a technical term. Gospel, who knows the term, what, what does gospel mean? Tim. Good. Good news, yeah. The gospel is good news. And, and when it was first termed, or what they usually use this term, was in a battle. When they're in a battle, and, and, and there's usually battles between cities before cities, and, and they have a messenger. And so after the battle, um, the people in the city would figure out, like, hey, what's going on? Did we win? Did we lose? And then a messenger would come from afar, and, and, and as the people watched, they would be looking like, what does, is the guy happy? Is he not happy? And then as he's coming closer, they would see on his helmet if there was a reef, and if he, if he was holding a palm branch and he was waving it, then they know, we have victory. This is the good news. That's the good news. The good news that they've won the battle. And we have a good news. The good news that we have is that Jesus has won the battle. Amen? Amen? Jesus has won the battle. This is why we come together. This is why we, we come together in a place like this. Not because we just feel down and we feel like, oh my goodness, like, oh man, I've been, my spiritual walk with God has been good. Let me go to church. And as we come to church, we're, we're encouraged. That does happen but that shouldn't be your lifeline. Let me say this again. That does happen, but that shouldn't be your lifeline. Why? Because the good news isn't only alive on a Sunday. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, follow Jesus Christ, raise your hand. Follow Jesus Christ, raise your hand. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, the good news isn't only good news on a Sunday. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, the good news also isn't only good news when you first come to know Jesus and you give your, your life as, his, as, as Lord and Savior. That is not only when the good news is good news. 
The good news is every single day of your life, you know that Jesus has paid the price and that transforms you, that changes you. That's why I get so excited when I talk about um, two couples about marriage. I love talking to couples about marriage. Just yesterday, um, uh, there was a, a, a guy and a girl um, who just got married. I congratulated them, and I, 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 I um, wrote to her and said, hey, you know what, if you're going through anything, if you want to, like, I, I love to share life with you. Why? Because the gospel has transformed so much of my life through my marriage. The gospel has been so real to me in my marriage. I'm not sure if there's anything else that's been so real, like especially in these last few months. But the gospel, because of the gospel and how the gospel can transform my life and our relationship, that's the power of the gospel. Not only to save me for eternity, but to save me on my day-to-day life. It is powerful. It is beautiful. Amen? How would you know? You don't, they're not married, right? <laughs> but you, are you married, Nick? Oh, okay. All right. Whoa. <laughs> Coronavirus uh, surprise, right? <laughs> so that's the technical term for good news, for the gospel, which is the good news. Now, bird's eye view, bird's eye view of the gospel. What is the truth of the gospel? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fly through these. Um, care group leaders, jot down these verses. Care group leaders, um, make sure that um, this is where going to be. You, you might talk about this. Um, but what do we know about the gospel? What do we know about gospel? So I'm not going to explain everything about what the gospel is, but what do we know about the gospel? Matthew 5, 23. There we find Jesus proclaiming the gospel. Mark 16, 15. Jesus commands us and tells us to preach the gospel. Philippians 1.17, we are to defend the gospel, okay? So we've, we've seen we are to proclaim the gospel. Jesus proclaims the gospel. We are called to preach and proclaim the gospel. We are called to defend the gospel. Philippians 1.27, we strive together in the gospel. Philippians 1 verse 5, there is the fellowship of the people in the gospel. Fellowship in the gospel. 2 Timothy 1.8, partakers in the afflictions of the gospel. Basically, we suffer because of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9 talks about not hindering the gospel. Romans 1.16, never being ashamed of the gospel. As Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 5, being empowered by the Holy Spirit to preach the gospel. I hope you got that. If not, you can ask me later on. This is, as it says in Galatians 1 verse 6, this is the only good news. This is the only good news. And I was thinking about this. How is this the only like, good news? There was a wedding yesterday. That's good news. There was a, a baby that was just born last week. Remember I announced that. And like, that's good news. It is the only good news because if you look at the big picture and if you, you, you look that, that you are later on forever condemned, like, oh, yeah, that is the good news. I can have amazing good news, small news here and there, but without Jesus, everything doesn't matter later on. So that makes this the good news. Now, to clarify this, uh, 1 Corinthians verse 15, what is the gospel? What is the gospel? 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Paul says this, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you. Okay, he's saying, hey, let me remind you of the gospel which you receive, in which you stand, by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. Okay, so he's saying, okay, this is the gospel, and hold fast to this, because you're being saved in this, unless you don't believe it. But here's what it is. For I deliver it to you, for I deliver to you, as of first importance, what I also receive, that Christ died for our sins, according to Scripture, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance to Scripture. The gospel is that Jesus died for your sin and for my sin, and that he rose again so that we may live. That's the gospel. How many of you, this is like mind-blowing, and this is the first time you've heard it? How many of you have heard this before? Raise your hand. Yeah? You've heard it before? Yeah, we've heard this. And so the question is, so what? So what? 
So this is the bird's eye view. This is what Paul takes us in in, in Colossians. Right? Now let me get into... Um, there's so much stuff in here, and it's funny because after I, I, I wrote my sermon stuff, I'm like, wow, I didn't even get like detailed into all this stuff. But you will see in here, okay, let me, just, let me just lay it out before you. If you see in this passage that the gospel truth is received by faith, we see that. He, it talk, he talks about it right there. And we see that there is, it's the result of love. We see, we see that, that it rests in hope. We see all these different things. But I want to I wanna, I wanna take a little different route this afternoon. And I want to talk about love. Everybody say love. Love. How many of you here love love? You love love. Lift up your hand. Yeah, hello? Yeah, hello. Yeah, good. All right. Special couples, right? I love here we're in, in um, Colossians 1 verse 3. It says, we always thank God, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray. I thank God, church, that he has led us here to pray. Let me say this again. I, I love that God has led us as House for All Nations International Campus to pray. Back in February, I believe it is, um, there was a call to prayer. And I'm not, like, the response was so-so, it was okay. And, and, uh, and then we had the prayer triads. How many of you are still doing the prayer triads? It should have ended, like, two weeks ago. I'm still not done yet, so I confess, right? We have one more to go. Woohoo. Some of you are still going through it. Praise God. Yeah, if, if you like, oops, I forgot about that. Continue on. It's okay. Continue on. It's been so beautiful. Uh, I'm praying together in my prayer triad, so continue on with that. I thank God that he has led us to pray. I thank God he's led us to pray. So we had Wednesday night prayers, and then Dimas, um, when we got into to the prayer triads, he started um, Tuesday mornings and Thursdays mornings. Three times a week we come together and pray. Now not everybody comes, and, and for the longest time it was just me and Dimas, and then there was Daphne, and then there was some people randomly who came here and there. And then we went through this whole season uh, for up to five months, five months um, of just wondering what's, ha what's happening with this whole COVID-19 and people are going through stuff. Did you go through stuff? You went through stuff? Lift up your hands. Yeah? Did it suck? Lift up your hands if it sucked. Yeah, okay, we're being real here, right? Sucked? Yes? Yeah, for many of you, it sucked. For some of you, you loved it, by the way. I think Nick was one of the ones who loved it. That's okay, no worries. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I gave him a call. He's like, yeah, man, it's, it's, it's fine, right? So I'm like, ooh. Yeah, now he gets it, right? Now, yeah. For most of us, it sucked. But I believe God was calling us to pray. And if there was anything that we could have done, it was pray. But let me confess to you before you, on behalf of the serve team leaders, the call was to pray. The serve team leaders were called to pray. Did they pray? No. And I'm not saying this point, point at them. But everybody was struggling. Everybody was going through stuff. And I loved it because last month or almost, I don't know, maybe it's last month or two months ago, then we came together and we said, and, and I confessed also as well that I had to take a lead. I had to take a stand. I confessed this uh, last week or a couple of weeks ago as well. That I have to be bold. I have to, like, I have to tune in to what the Holy Spirit is, is leading and how he's guiding us. And after five months, I believe God's saying, okay, wake up, church. Wake up, House for All Nations International Campus. Wake up. I know your pain. I know what you're going through. But it's time to wake up and be the church. Why? Because other people need you. Followers of Jesus Christ, raise your hand. Followers of Jesus Christ, raise your hand. I'm talking to those who are followers of Jesus Christ. If you are not a follower of Jesus Christ, I pray and hope that you watch what we do and you say, wow, they love one another despite their differences. But right now, what I'm doing with each one of you here, whether you're online, whether you're on Zoom, or whether you're here, I'm trying to build a foundation. I'm trying to build a foundation with you, for you, so that you begin to understand what does it mean for me to be a follower of Jesus Christ? And so I thank God that he's led us to pray. As Paul says here, when we pray for you, we always thank God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith. I want to thank God that you guys are here right now. 
you are still standing on the faith of Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior despite your challenges right now. I want to thank God for each one of you here. By his providence, by his power, you're still standing in faith. Even though you might be shaken, even though you might not, you're not, you're not, you're not like standing strong, but you are still walking in the faith. I thank God. I thank God for that. Now here's the thing, as we, today, as we reflect on Thanksgiving, I believe that Thanksgiving and being thankful, thankfulness is a big part of prayer. I believe that there's a lack of prayer because we don't thank God enough. We don't pray much because we're not necessarily a thankful people. Yes or no? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Jed. Right. And I believe that thankfulness or thanklessness goes hand in hand with discontentment. Throughout the pandemic, I was discontent in so many ways. The reason why we get bored is because we become discontent. The reason we become bored is because we become discontent and we have this lack of thankfulness. So I wonder how many times do we come before God birthed out of, out of a place of discontentment or birthed out of a place of thankfulness? Let me ask this question again. I wonder how many times that we come to God and we come to him in prayer and it's birthed out of the place of discontentment rather than the place of thankfulness. How would you know? Is that every time you come to God is because you request, you ask something, you want something. Now, let me say this. It's not wrong to ask. But how is your thankfulness? How are you in giving thanks? Are you, are you just filled with thanksgiving? And I think every one of us here can repent of that, including myself. What we often do is we, we simply um, uh, bring the stuff of this world and we direct it to God. We, our, our, our experiences are horizontal experiences. And what we, what we go through on a day-to-day -day basis, we then present it to God and we call that prayer. Yes? Let me ask this question to you. When you think about me and you think about talking to me, are you actually talking to me? So, okay, they're like, Whoa. so, 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 say, Jessalyn, like, yeah, um, you're, you're on the bus or something, right? And you're, you're heading over to the church, right? And you're like, oh, I need to talk to Pastor Gerald about something and making sure that everything's okay. And so let me just think in my mind, uh, uh, let me think these thoughts. And uh, that's you talking to me, is it? No, right? You got to pick up the phone. You got to actually make a conversation. Now, uh, let me say this. So many times, this is how we treat God. You know my mind, God. You know everything inside of my mind. You know, you know my thoughts. The Bible says it so clearly, and so that's my prayer life. But I also want to say this. I want to thank God because in the past week or two, I've seen a lot of changes in your mindset, church. I thank God for that. As we came together last week in prayer, we, we shared different testimonies of like, yeah, I've been more intentional in honoring God. I mean, it's, 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 we started off the year in fear and trembling, and we started off the year in talking about how great God is. Just a reminder that we are nothing and he is everything. And I thank God that you guys are responding. You are honoring God. Young people, I know it's hard because we live in this world where, okay, well, you matter and being independent matters. And so, so what your thoughts are are so important and we forget to honor others, especially God. Why? Because he knows all. So we, we assume that everything he knows is, is like a prayer to him. Do you, do you, are you following? Yeah? You following? Good. Many times we just think that when we close our eyes, that means we're praying. But again, I really thank God that many of you are beginning to honor God and really praying. Many of you are taking intentional steps and finding ways to live as saints. And I pray and hope that some of you here who are online right now, you've responded to the word of God last week and say, okay, if I come to church and that is a holy place. That means the time I spent from three to five, no matter where I am, that is my holy place. That is my sanctuary, even though it's at home. I've set this time apart, three to five. Today's going to be till 4.15, I think, I hope. 
I've set apart this bedroom, this space, wherever it is. This is now holy because I have set it apart for God. I want to remind you, church, make sure you set apart your place for God on Sunday, wherever you are right now. If you haven't done so, ask God to forgive you. God, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm cooking while I'm listening to this. I'm sorry that I'm, I'm watching Netflix as I'm doing this. Netflix is so much better than this preaching, right? Whatever it may be. I mean, you can say amen to that. Amen? Oh, yeah, huh? Yeah, I do. I do this trick. <laughs> I'm going to judge you now. I'm uh, just kidding. But set apart your place. Set apart your time. Why? Because God sees you even though we don't. I wonder what our lives would really look like if we thank God more followers of Jesus Christ. Raise your hand. Back in the ancient world, it was dangerous to be a Christian. Every town and city worshipped gods. In this time of the Colossians, every town and city, they worshipped gods and goddesses. And in fact, they made room and they said, okay, well this city is not only inhabited by, by human beings, it's also inhabited by gods and goddesses and human beings. And so whatever flourished there in that city, that would be, uh, uh, the, there would be gods there that say, okay, there, if there's a lot of water, they'd say, oh, the goddess of water, you are so amazing. And for Christians to then declare, no, I don't believe in those gods. I now believe that there's only one true God and that he's the only way. That was very dangerous for them to proclaim. Because whenever something then happened, and say water didn't flow, uh, because you didn't honor the God of water, and then they would be like, this is because of you, because you, don't, you did not honor the God of water. It was dangerous to be a Christian in the ancient days. Second thing that you need to remember, that Paul, he wrote this in what? Where did he write this? Where was he? He was in prison. He was in jail. I want you to remember that Paul was writing from prison. Why is this important? Listen in. I think this has so much to do with us. Listen in. No matter what the circumstances are in your life, God can still be very much at work in you and through you. No matter what your circumstances is, God can still be at work in you and through you as Paul was in prison. Your circumstances in no way limits God from doing what he wants to do through your life. And so as we go through this, remember that this is being written by a man who is sitting in prison. And while he's in prison, he is thanking God. There's, th there's, there's two things about prayer. Write this down. Our circumstances shouldn't keep us from being thankful and praying for others. Our circumstances shouldn't keep us from being thankful and praying for others. In this moment, as you've gone through the COVID-19 and this whole seven gruesome months, and right now we're just on the verge of not knowing if it's going to spike again or not, has your circumstances right now, because of the COVID-19, have it kept you from being thankful? Has it kept you from praying for others? It didn't stop Paul. Two things about prayer. That's the first thing. The second one is, there's always evidences of God's grace in things around us. There's always evidences of God's grace in things around us. God is always at work. A month ago when we, um, after realizing this, and God, I feel he was just nudging in my heart, let's move forward. I brought together the serve team PICs and said, and, and we asked the question, what's God doing? Right, remember that? You, were you, I don't know, remember? What's God doing? What's God doing in the midst of, of this church in this moment? Yes, we know that the enemy's at work, but what is God doing? It's so important for you to ask the question on a day-to-day -day life. We wake up in the morning, it's like, oh man, oh, it's raining, oh, there's this, oh, there's that, you know? But ask the question, what is God doing? What is God doing? You see, it takes no supernatural power to complain, right? We don't need supernatural powers like, ooh, help me, like, oh, like, no, no. It, it takes no leadership to complain. 
Anybody can do that. In fact, if all you do is complain, the Bible talks about that. That's called the evidences of the flesh in Galatians 5. In Galatians 5, it talks about the, the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience. It talks about nine fruit of the Spirit. And also before that, it talks about the evidences of the flesh, the fruit of the flesh. And division is one of them. Strife is one of them. Dissension is one of them. It takes no leadership to complain. It takes no supernatural power to complain. Have you ever been in the presence of people like this? People around you who complain or, or you're just in the room, you're just having a good time and, and all of a sudden this person comes in and says one word and you're like, oh. You're, you're like so excited to move forward and it's like this person says, yeah, this. Like, oh, oh God, help me. <laughs> it takes great power to see evidences of God even through things when things are going bad. Now I'm going to look in the scripture right here where it says, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus, when we pray for you. Why is Paul being thankful? Why is he being thankful? Here it says right here, because of faith in Jesus. I got less than 10 more minutes. Praise the Lord. Okay. Why being thankful, faith in Jesus? Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to skip through many of this right now. Okay. For the sake of time. Faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, and love. Say that together with me. One, two, three. Faith, hope, and love. Why was Paul praying? Why was he thanking God? Because he saw the faith of the people. He saw the faith and said, hey, you have faith in Christ Jesus. I thank God for that. The love you have for who? What does it say there? Look in your Bibles. What does it say? Love for some of the saints, right? Love for some of the saints, right? Yes, no. No, you're right, Jed, right? says love for all the saints huh yeah even the annoying saints you know it's it's easy to love sinners by the way and you're like no well yeah if i knew let's use justin as an example jesus right here is that okay yeah if i knew justin always never kept to her word that's not her by the way right if i always knew that she never kept to her word my expectation of her would be so much less right so if i say hey jesseline Oh, this is so funny because I just forgot. Uh, uh, I had a meeting with somebody and I totally forgot and I screwed up. So I, this is me really, right? But I'm using Justin as an example. Say, hey, I say, hey, Justin, let's meet up and stuff. And then if I knew she always never fulfilled the meetings and she was never there, then my expectation of her would be like, yeah, I, I'm, she might not even appear. She might not come. So it's easy for me to, to know that and love a sinner because I know like my expectation for her is low. But for you to love a saint, for you to love someone who's in the church, it's so much harder. Why? Because your expectation many times is higher than it has, should be. Because you think that you should love because they love. You think you should love because it's easier to love them. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah? Faith, hope, and love. Paul thanks God because these people loved all the saints. My question to you is, do you love all the saints? As he talks about, you can open up 1 Corinthians 13, um, right there, uh, there's that famous message that even non-Christians know about love. Love is patient, love is kind, love does not, and all this stuff. Now, my question is, okay, I'm jumping through things, so just hold on, um, just, just continue to follow on. How does faith, hope, and love work together? How does faith, hope, and love work together? As Paul thanks God for these, these things that the people have, faith, hope, and love, how do these things work together? They work to be together because faith or trust in Jesus it has enabled them to love others and all the saints. And how does it work together? The hope that they see coming, as Dimas preached about three weeks ago or four weeks ago, enable them to love one another. To clarify this, I'll clarify it with a question. Could it be that we don't love much because we don't trust much? Could it be that we don't love much because we don't hope much? How does no faith and no hope hinder your love? 1 John 4.18 says this, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. The opposite of faith is not lack of faith. 
the opposite of faith is fear. Faith moves us, but fear freezes us. Is that not true? Fear keeps you from loving, right? All right, I got four minutes. This is impossible. <laughs> All right. They've minimized my time, so I'm on, a, on a t crunch time. I got to work on this much better. Let me say this. Okay, I'm just going to dive into, uh, just follow along best you can. Um, as House for All Nations for National Campus, I was praying this week. I was praying, I was praying this week. And I, I'm going to say this with boldness. And I've probably never said this, but I, I, I want to lead us in this direction. House for All Nations or National Campus, we need to be a church planning campus. Let me say this again. We need to be a church planting campus or a campus planting campus. I haven't said this much. This church is supposed to be a church planting church. That's what it's supposed to be. I thank God that I've been meeting with the leadership team of House for All Nations, and, and this November I, we're going to be meeting together with all the pastors, and we're going to have a three-day retreat just to, just to really see, God, where are you leading us? Where are you guiding us? And the leadership team has something that they want to share with us. But as I was praying this week, I just want to say this in boldness. I didn't even talk to the leadership team about this, but I believe that this is where God may be leading us. I want to just say, no, not maybe. I think this is where God's leading us. This is where God's leading us. Let me say it with more boldness. This is where God's leading us. Okay? That we need to be a church planning campus. Followers of Jesus Christ, lift up your hands. If you are following Jesus Christ, that is what we are called to do. There's two misconceptions of the church. Number one, big means healthy. That's not true. If it's a big church, it's a healthy church. No. It can be a big church with false teachings. Or it could be a big church centered on one powerful, gifted preacher. Question I have is, are you excited when coming to church because you get to hear a specific speaker? Or are you excited to come to church because you get to be with the church? Misconception number two, small means community. Small means community. That's not true. Okay, let me, let me get this. Just because you're a big church doesn't mean you're a bad church, by the way. There's a lot of amazing big churches, and the reason why they're big is because they've done a good job. Now, we got to be careful. Again, why? Are they gospel-centered, okay? So I'm not saying big churches are bad. Absolutely not. Number two, small churches mean community. Small, oh, small means community. It's not true. Because why? Small can mean intimately gross, if you know what I'm saying. Small can mean intimately gross, but something begins to happen when there is a genuine community and you cannot remain small because why? Because other people see that and say, I want to be part of that. I want to be part of that group. I want to be part of that care group. And as you dive into that, it's like, oh, this is why they love one another. It's not because they're so great. They call them, them themselves saints, but they look bad. But they love Jesus and they depend on Jesus and their focus is on Jesus. And that's why they can continue to love one another, even brokenly. Faith Hope and love must be grounded in the gospel. One minute. No way. Right? Faith, hope, and love must be grounded in the gospel. We'll try better next week. Okay? This is a test drive. This is a test run. All right? Let me, let me just read what I have here. Okay? Uh, let me just read this so that I don't go way over time. If your faith, hope, and love is placed in something else, which is your idol, you will have little or no love for others. We used to have, listen to this, we used to have downtown missions outreach, Potter's Place Mission. But when the COVID-19 happened, we put it on hold. There are many who are so lost in their poverty. There are many so lost in their poverty. Yes or no? Yes. And they need the love of Jesus. Yes or no? Many hurting and dying in their poverty. All we need to do is just, just walk the streets of East Hastings. But, listen to this, but there are many more who are lost in their prosperity. And you don't know why, you know why we don't talk about this? Because that is our idols as well. We don't talk about prosperity because that's our idol. We don't want to talk about it. It's easy to talk about homelessness, drugs, and all that. But let's talk about bubble tea. Yeah? Amen? 
Amen. Yeah, okay, got your attention. Let's talk about bubble tea. Let's talk about Starbucks. Let's talk about Mercedes, BMWs. I drive a Volkswagen. Let's drive about, let's talk about all that stuff. You're like, what are you talking about? What I'm talking about is this. Okay, I added some more stuff. Let's have, uh, let, let's talk about having a late night dinner after you already had your first dinner. Anybody like me? Yes, yes, yeah. Let's talk about popping that frozen pizza box in the oven only for you to stuff yourself while you forget about downtown and to love others who are starving to death. Do you have a BMW? Do you have bubble tea, uh, Starbucks? Is it, is it wrong to have that? No. There's nothing wrong with Christians making money. Amen? Amen. But it's wrong for Christians to be rich. As Dave Ramsey mentioned, Christians are pauper. Christians are dirt poor. Why? Because everything they have belongs to Jesus. He's the rich one. We're just managers. We get to serve a super rich guy. It's not wrong for Christians to make money, a lot of money. But it's wrong for Christians to keep it. There's more danger in the Bible connected to prosperity than poverty. Why is it that in the time when people downtown need it the most, we have plugged out? Answer that question. I mean, this question is not just for you. It's for me. Obviously, it's for me. Why is it when the people downtown in East Hastings need the love of God the most? House for all nations, you and I have plugged out, and we have stopped doing missions. As I read earlier, I said this, 1 John 4, 18, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. I wrote down 1 Daryl, where is it? 1 Daryl 4, 18, in opposite of 1 John 4, 18. And to look at that oppositely, I, I wrote this, There is no love in fear. But perfect fear drives out love because love has to do with sacrifice. The one who loves is not made perfect in fear. Do you have fear? We cannot be made perfect in fear. The love that God calls us to is a supernatural kind of love. And you see that in verse 8. In verse 8 where it says this, He uh, is a faithful minister in Christ on your behalf. Talking to Epaphras, about Epaphras. And has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Do you have love in the Spirit, church? Do you have love in the Spirit? The first fruit of the, the, the Spirit in Galatians 5 is love. Love. This is the love that we, ha- we are to have for one another so that the world may know that we are his disciples. Let's not talk about all this other stuff. The bottom line is, do you have this supernatural love that God has poured into you, that he's given to you? Do you have this? This is how the world will know that we are his disciples when we have love for one another. This is the kind of love that the world will take notice. What some of you have noticed in the past month is not this kind of love. That's why we're diving in the book of Colossians. I think we can learn something from this book. Not only learn, but I believe that we can grow in our faith and our walk. But I want to warn you also as Paul has warned us in this book that it's not going to be easy. I love that one of, the camp, uh, one of the care groups have named their care groups House on the Rock. This is a, rem- a reminder. House on the Rock is not the one who listens to the word only, but the one who listens to it and does it. I'm going to read this. Um, and I'll explain it a little bit later, but I'm going to read this and... Um, Historian Rodney Stark, in his great book, The Rise of Christianity, wonders why the Christian movement grew so rapidly in the first few centuries after Jesus' crucifixion. Its adherents were a small band of social outcasts. What transformed this ragtag group of zealots into a global movement is such a spectacular... Like, what transformed this group um, into a global movement at such a spectacular pace? Stark's inquiry concluded that the surge of the growth of Christianity was rooted in the response of the early Christians to a wave of great pandemics. 
Hey, any of you living in a pandemic? Huh? Yeah? Okay. It's like the first century Christians. At least two plagues wrecked the developing world in the first three centuries after the death of Christ. And Christians did something no one else would do. They stayed, they helped, and they gave their lives to in doing something. In Stark's book, Dionysus, the, the bishop of Alexandria described in a letter how believers responded to a deadly plague that killed an estimated 5,000 believe, uh, 5,000 people a day in the Roman Empire sometime around 260 AD. says this, Most of our brother Christians showed unbounded love and loyalty, never sparring themselves and thinking only of one another. Heedless of danger, they took charge of the sick, attending to every need and ministering to them in Christ. And with them departed this life serenity happy, for they were infected by others with diseases, drawing on themselves the sickness of their neighbors and cheerfully accepting their pains. Many in nursing and curing others transferred their death to some th- transferred their death to themselves and died in their stead. The best of brothers lost their lives in this way. Such is our root. The growth of Christianity was not because we were fearful, but the growth of Christianity is because we knew the love of Jesus that died for us. Now let me not get you, like, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying, now just go out there, like who cares what the government say. I'm not saying that whatsoever. Listen to the government, honor the government. Let's not be stupid. Let's not go out there and be crazy. However, are you led by fear or are you led by love, church? Followers of Jesus Christ, lift up your hands. Followers of Jesus Christ, lift up your hands. What are you led by? It's, it's time to stop complaining. It's time to stop saying, oh, I feel this, oh, I feel that. Now, I'm not saying that we hold one another up. We need to do that. Come to care groups and say, hey, hold me up. Hey, help me. Hey, I need encouragement. Hey, do this. But then you get up and say, but how can I be encouragement? Why? Because I know the love of Christ that is in me to love you too. Amen? Amen? I have no clue why I'm preaching this way. (laughs) It's Thanksgiving. I should be a little bit more cheerful, right? But I feel that there's a message for you and I today. I'm calling out the church, and more so before I'm calling out to you, I'm calling out for myself to repent. You know how hard it was for me to receive that God was rebuking me and saying, where are you on the streets right now? Where's your love? Are you led by fear? And today, I don't know, it just happens to that we are doing this test run to come together. And maybe some of you here are sitting here. Maybe you're fearful. Maybe you're not. And maybe some of you here, as you come in and um, next week, just I want to just ask you this question: Are you led by fear or are you led by love? Follower of Jesus Christ, raise your hands. I wonder if God were to ask us that question on a day-to-day basis, on an hourly basis. And as we do life, he says, are you following Jesus Christ? If you are, raise your hand. Are you following Jesus Christ? Yeah, Jesus. Yeah, 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 Holy Spirit. Yeah, Holy Spirit. I wonder if that would change how we do things and why we do things. All right, let's end there. (laughs) I'll invite the music team up. I'm only off by nine minutes. You guys okay? Yeah? Are you okay? Once again, thanks for joining us in this, um, in Zoom. My, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be as serious as I possibly can with each one of you here those of you also who are on Zoom, some of you here will not be meeting with us for maybe over a year. And that's okay. You have relatives, families, you have conditions. And I'm not talking about don't just go off and just be silly. And No, no, no. 
But I want each one of you here to know the love of Jesus, that Jesus has pursued you, that he has loved you, that he has paid this price on the cross, and that we need to be led by this love. Have you been transformed by the gospel? As you sit here and you listen to whatever this was earlier, this sermon, have you been transformed by the gospel? And maybe some of you here, as you sit wherever you are at home, or if you're here right now, maybe you have forgotten the gospel, what the gospel really was. But I want to deliver to you as of first importance, something that I've received that I give to you as well, that Christ died in accordance to scripture, that he was buried, but then he rose again in accordance to scripture, and I believe scripture in every bitty part of it. And he's the life, he's the resurrection, and he can resurrect you from your life. That have you been transformed by the gospel to love? If not, receive this love in this moment. If not, respond to this love in this moment. And then finally, if you have received this love and this power of the gospel, then my one message to you is go and love. Go and love. Go and love as Christ has loved you. Whatever it takes, whenever it takes, wherever it takes. Do this in humility, with wisdom, for sure being led by the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the church of Colossae who had a deep love for the saints, for all the saints. I pray, Lord, that that would be true to House World Nations International Campus. And I pray for those who have not been, who does not call themselves follower of Jesus Christ, that they would also then take that step and say, I want that, I want that love, that kind of love that, that no one else can give, your love, Jesus, that transforms me to love as well. I pray, oh Lord, that we would be this church, that we would be a camp, a church planting campus, oh God. Why? Because we're known for our love for one another because of the love that we have received from you, Jesus. So as we sing, respond to him. As we sing, would you just give your hearts to Jesus?